Well, welcome to uh, welcome to the journey, and uh, Lynn, it's uh, great to have you um, on on the show. Uh, could you do me a favor? Pronounce, pronounce your last name for me. Boreen. Boreen. Okay. And I, I was looking at it, and I was thinking I'm going to massacre this, but that's yeah. easier than I thought. Boreen. Boreen. And so, but Lynn, thank you very much for coming on to the um, coming on to the journey. The journey is um, just a, a show, a podcast about the story of transformation and how individuals have throughout their own lives or through their own experience, maybe with significant others, that they've gone through a journey of um, failing forward, um, being able to change their life into um, living the way that um, God intended them to live, living the way that they were meant meant to live. Um, we all have obstacles in our life, and um, yep. and what 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 a lot of times we try to look at is how do those obstacles maybe opportunities for growth and yes. and for a learning opportunity. Yes. But before we jump into all that, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about about yourself and uh, what do you what do you do for fun? What do you uh, if you're going to go out and have fun and um, I know you're married and have some have children, so what right. would you do? Um, well, I'm married to my husband John for a long time. Okay. Um, <laughs> Years and years, and we have three adult kids, okay. one in Rockford and two out of town. Okay. So um, he's been retired for seven or eight years, and I was only working part-time, so it's been easy for us to now say, well, we have kids out of town, we can go see them, we can... Um, do some of the things that we'd like to do. He had his own office, which made it, and he was alone in his office, so it made it more difficult yeah. for him to uh, take longer trips. We usually took trips during spring break gotcha. when our kids sure. were off. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we went to Disneyland, yeah. we went to Wash or Disney World, sure. we went to Washington, D.C. That okay. was one of our cooler trips because my kids like history. And um, did the main things, but okay. then after he retired, we started thinking, well, gee, there's so much we haven't done. For right. instance, the Grand Canyon, we had okay. never been there. So okay. we started doing things like that. Gotcha. And what did your husband do before he retired? He's an attorney. Oh, an attorney. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I, I remember when I first opened up KP Counseling and and as working for myself or in a, in a private practice or solo, and go, oh, you, you're your own boss? I'm like, really? Is that how that works? I know. <laughs> it was not very much like that at all. <laughs> I, I could dictate my own hours, but it not only cost to go on the vacation, but it cost in the production you didn't do one you were away. Yeah, it gets complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, well, good. He, and what kind of attorney was he? Was he a defense attorney? Um, he did um, things like workman's comp oh, okay. and a little bit of personal injury I and see. Okay. things like that. Oh, okay. And then you said you worked part-time. What did you do part-time? Uh, well, um, for many years I was home with the kids. My uh, education was as an occupational therapist, and oh. I did work um, as an OT in the earlier years, and then part time until um, the third one was born, and then I I wasn't working after that. But I did uh, I had pretty significant commitments um, in jail ministry, okay, and. Um, took it seriously. Okay. It was two to three days a week uh, for four or five hours. And then I volunteered for a Christian ministry and did office work. And then I worked a little part-time for them. Oh, okay. Okay. So th that uh, that uh, Christian ministry, was that, tie was that tied directly to a church or was it a, just an organiza Christian organization? Well, it's Love in the Name of Christ, which oh, still okay. exists, but has been absorbed by One Body Collaboratives. Okay. Yep. Yep. I'm very... I'm familiar with their work. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Okay. I was an office person and a phone person. Gotcha. Because okay. you have to spend quite a lot of time with people on the phone. Sure, yeah. And direct, uh, finding out about them and directing them to resources in the community. Yeah, and trying to trying to decipher what their actual needs are and, and helping them with that. Yeah, yes, exactly. and how did you get um, four months behind on your rent? Yeah, and yeah. 
wh why is it that you're just calling now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it's it's very interesting. I <clears throat> have done a lot of different types of work as a social worker, and many times being able to help someone, um, maybe pay their rent if they're behind, or help them out with you know something else with clothing or whatever, may help in some situations, but it also may end up just being a band-aid, as you know, oh, yes. and it doesn't necessarily really help solve a problem right. or it doesn't isn't a solution to the problem it just solves the temporary piece exactly giving a man to fish instead of teaching giving a man a fish instead of teaching him to fish exactly mm -hmm. exactly so um so then but you said something about you were trained though to be an occupational therapist yes that was your interest yes so how did that how did that interest come about to want to be an occupational therapist well i was in college and um i was talked into starting as a math major um, because my dad said, you know, aim high, your grades are good, and all this, okay. but I didn't have an affinity for it. Okay. Um, affinity and I knew for math or affinity for math. Okay. And I knew this yeah. because my brothers did, and one time uh, my next brother, Bruce, said, oh, I was taking a test and I forgot the formula for a pendulum so I had to derive it and I didn't even had no clue what he was talking about <laughs> sure, sure. and I thought okay this is why I keep saying this is not my thing yeah so I did get into something else. Gotcha. Okay. And but and you enjoyed uh, that aspect of OT work and then and helping people regarding the the physical aspect of helping rehab. Um well it's Occupational in the sense that how do people occupy their time? Oh, so okay. for a homemaker, okay. can she have some adaptive devices? Okay. Uh, can she have a utensil cough? Can she have a, um, a, a steak for um, a potato so that it so that she can cut it one handed? Oh, okay. um, exercises, sure, but sure. not sure. as much as with a physical therapist. And I was able to carry that whole concept over into so much of my volunteer work because it translated into, okay, a woman is in jail, how does, how is her life affected? Mm -hmm. What does she need to shore her up to encourage her that it is possible to have life after a jail sentence mm -hmm. or even a prison sentence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So my whole life, I feel like, has been, um, my thought has always been, okay, what are we going to do with the limitations we have? Okay, okay. Because that's really what OT is. How right. are you going to function with a stroke? How are you going to function with burns and now you don't have all of your digits? Yeah. How are you going to function with a um, uh, spinal cord injury? Right, right. So in, in, in those circumstances, specifically those circumstances, those things are not going to come back. Those digits are not going to come back. That spinal Correct. cord injury is not going to come back. Correct. So what can we do to help you be functional yes. and not uh, as, and be as independent as, yes. as you can be? Yep. And so so that also probably is part of just where your, your vision was, where you, you, you quickly picked up on how to see those things as they were teaching you and, and versus with the math, um, where it was like, I just couldn't, just, just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just couldn't see it. And no. I, and I, I can relate to that, um, very similar for myself. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where sometimes we uh, see where, where we're gifted in something, where God's given us some gifts and that they naturally start unfolding as we get matched up with the, either the right profession in this case or the right, right education. And, and it doesn't necessarily really matter if it's working for this group or no. we're volunteering for something else. No, if you we, can translate it. Yeah, you still see. Mm -hmm. still and I'm seeing. a people person, and that has been kind of one of the guiding Sure. Um, parameters of my life, and and my kids are the same. You know, okay. we're not big technical mm -hmm. 
math, science, people. We just we have to do something with people, relating to people, helping people. Sure. I have sure. a teacher and and a speech yeah. pathologist okay. and. Um, a customer service uh, manager. Okay, so your oldest is a teacher? No, the oldest uh, is, she works on the campus of Texas A&M University as a customer service representative okay. to the university okay. to say what can her company, who does all the maintenance and all the custodial and, and all the dietary and all that, what can we do better? Okay. And so she's relating. It's a big campus, mm -hmm, sixty thousand sure. students. Yeah. So she's relating to many, 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 many people. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so she's down in Texas, and she's your oldest. Mm -hmm. And then your next one. Mark is a speech and language pathologist, and he's just finishing his master's. He's changing careers. Okay. And his home is San Diego, California. Oh, really? Okay. I have a friend yeah. that lives up there. Okay. Yeah, they're both far. Yeah, no kidding. Requiring a plane ride. And he. He is, you said he's switching. Uh, sw he switching was. Profession. He majored in business, oh, okay. undergrad, and then he just was searching for what did he, what could he really connect with? And yeah. again, I think it had a lot to do with people. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and it's interesting how sometimes we may think we can. Okay, someone tells us we're good at this, or, or and, and we we may test well at this, or exactly. this, is, this is how we can maybe make some money yes. and be you know uh, be independent, and then we find out that no, this no. is no, and really that's what happened to him. Sure. He said, "I can't. I can do sales well." I don't want to do sales. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got to find something else. And sure. he did. He searched. He shadowed. He read. He took his time to find out what's going to fit him. Good. Yeah. Good. Good deal. And then you're and then your youngest. She is a teacher in Rockford, okay. and she loves teaching. She is. They're all in their thirties, and she teaches. Um, she's taught in several places, private school, and. Um, She's taught refugees English as a second language, and now she's in a fifth grade class in a bilingual class, okay. and um, she just loves being a teacher. She okay. says, "I know this is what Scott, what God's called me to do." Nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, good deal. Well, I know, Lynn, um, how we met, and this is also part of your story, was that you had come to one of um, one of the events that I put on every year mm -hmm. um, through Shatter Our Silence, and this was our first Artists Out of the Ashes event that we put on in September of um, 2018 last year. Yes. And in somewhere in there, you, you know, that during that evening, you had come up to me and said, "I have a story that you might um, I also have a story yeah. yes I wasn't trying to really get into it at that point because yeah. it's yeah. I mean, yeah. you had you were there was a couple people around so yes yes <laughs> and you had literature and t-shirts that's yeah. how I got my first t-shirt yeah. which I kind of trashed and got holes in and yeah. I needed a second t-shirt <laughs> because people do ask me what is SOS sure. what is shatter our silence yeah. and I have an opportunity to speak sure. to them about mental illness illness, sure. people come out of the woodwork, out of the closets, yeah. if they find out that you have a listening ear yeah. for mental health. Yeah, it's, I, I agree with you. I, I, it's funny, surprising. I, I was down in Nashville, um, Tennessee, uh, a little bit less than a year ago, and I was uh, just standing in line to, we were getting brisket, and we were just standing in line to, to do that, and someone stood behind, had an SOS shirt on, and they asked me about the back of the shirt. We, yep. We which is being, a segue. Yeah, being a light in another's darkness. And so we end up having a long conversation about that. And, right. And uh, she lives out in New Jersey. And uh, so it was, a, it was very interesting. So, yes, that does happen quite a bit. So, yes. So with that, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, uh, that part of your story? And I know that it's pretty extensive. And feel free to mention as much as um, that you want. But you uh, had some of your um, family members struggled with um, um, mental illness. Oh yes, to a tragic degree. Yes. Yeah, and and do they? Uh, you were the oldest of, of your of your of siblings. Four. Mm -hmm. Four siblings. Yep. Yeah. Um, I was uh, nine when my baby brother was born. Okay. Next to me is a. And his name is what's your Bruce. Bruce is your next brother. Yeah. But then we've lost. 
in a tragic way, my sister Anne, who's four years younger than Bruce, okay. and our younger brother Scott, who's two years younger than Anne. Okay. okay. But there were four of us. So, so tell us a little bit, like growing up. What, what was it like growing up, being the oldest of four? Mm -hmm. And there's, I think, nine, nine, eight, nine, nine years, years nine between. Years mm -hmm. okay. And so, t tell us, tell us a little bit of what was it like growing up with a, with a family of, uh, it would be six of you. Six you know, with of mom, us. With mom and dad. And yep. then, um, so what was it like growing up to be the oldest of, of, of four? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm the true, you know, representative of the oldest, which okay. is the responsible, um, conscientious person. Um, and my dad was also an attorney, a uh, different, very different type of attorney than my husband. Um, but we started out in in the suburbs of Chicago, and he took the train, the still the same metro train, mm. um, to LaSalle Street for work. And then when I was 10, almost 11, um, there was one person in his firm from the Chicago office already working in Rockford, and they asked for someone who would be willing to join that person. Okay. And my mom and dad said, okay. Mm. So we moved here, and I went to Bloom School for sixth grade, and then Lincoln um, okay, sure. Junior High. Yeah. And at that time, it was seventh, eighth, and ninth, oh, yeah. because Guilford was busting at the seams, yeah. and then Guilford for 10, 11, and 12. And um, my, we were very fortunate. My mom uh, had the opportunity to stay home with us and loved being home with us. She was, um, by education, a CPA, an accountant. Oh. She had worked as an accountant when they lived out east. She had um, worked quite a bit before um, they married, had children, mm -hmm. and um, but then they decided that that she would be home with the kids. Okay. Well, of course, they didn't know that they'd have four, but sure. that was how it went. Yeah, yeah, okay. And and so as you, you guys moved to Rockford, mm -hmm. and and as you get into your later teen years and your siblings are getting older, um, was there any signs of, uh, of of depression or anxiety during that time period, or did that reveal itself a little bit later with your siblings? For me? Um, for your siblings, because you had talked about that was part of your story, or, or maybe even for yourself, yeah, I guess, because that, that also was part of your story, was that you had your own depression and anxiety. My anxiety was manifested in the teen years um, with an eating disorder. Oh, okay. Somehow I got the idea at my tiny size at the time, um, five feet tall and whatever, 105 pounds at that time, that I was gaining weight mm. and that my thighs were too heavy okay. and that I needed to go on a diet and that I needed to uh, have diet foods. And at the time, Tab oh, yes, I remember was tab. on the market. Oh, that was nasty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, back to the future, they refer to mm -hmm. Mike, Michael J. Fox says, can I have a tab? And the, and the thinking he's going to get a Diet Coke, mm -hmm. and the person says, a tab? You haven't ordered anything yet. Uh, because sure. he didn't know what a what sure. tab was. Yes, well, yes. it was this diet, it was this, it was like Diet Coke. Yeah. So that was big, and that was kind of the start okay. of um, these diet foods for women, diet pop. I don't think they existed before, because mm -hmm. when I was young, we drank uh, like orange and grape, and my cousins drank Dr. Pepper, and I don't mm -hmm. remember diet drinks. Yeah. Um, I remember, the first I remember of hearing about Tab might my dad's youngest sister, um, who's only nine years older than me, was um, drinking Tab, and it was probably around like 74, 75, early 70s, mid 70s. Yes, yeah. so this was just before that when I was still at Guilford. I graduated from Guilford in 70, but that was a big thing, and then 
I got it in my head that, you know, the longer you could go without eating, the better. Mm. Well, you can imagine what happens to a teen girl um, developing and trying to not eat, mm -hmm. and then at 5 or 6 o'clock, just three other kids in the house, my dad in the house, open the cupboard, there's Oreos, there's... Mm -hmm. Ho hos, there's mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> snowballs sure, and sure. you know all that. Um, so the snacks, the sweets, the food was always there, but um, you didn't see any magazine covers in the late '60s that mentioned problems with food, eating disorders. None of them had been named, as far as I know, or mm -hmm. you didn't see right. articles or see anything about them. I think in this day and age, at least women, young women, teens, even 10, 12-year-olds, they know mm -hmm. what an eating disorder is. Mm -hmm. They know when somebody's trying to diet and loses too much weight. I mean, they're starting to become aware of that. Yeah. At the time, there was no language. Right. There were no words. So I, I had recent, um, a few months ago, I did a, a talk at the um, local um, community college, Rock Valley College, and we talked about raising the awareness about um, eating disorders and body image and disordered eating. Yes. And, and that being on that continuum of, of eating disorders, of where you start getting to fat diets and you start the beginning process of restriction and, and then, or restricting certain types of food is, yes. now they, they refer to that all falling into the category of disordered eating. Disordered eating. And until, and then there's a, but there's potential risk of that evolving into uh, more of anorexia, uh, um, bulimia. Well, there's so much risk yeah. because it gets to be gratifying when you start losing weight but then some girls can't stop. Right, right. So I didn't have the kind of eating disorder that's now known as um, bulimia. Um, I didn't do any throwing up. I was not truly anorexic because I had, and it took a long time for this to even be identified, I had <clears throat> binge starve okay. syndrome. Sure. So um, I restricted myself and restricted myself until I lost 20 to 25 pounds and I wanted to see that scale at a certain number yeah. and then all hell would break loose and I would just eat till I was practically sick but that was as much as mm -hmm. I ate and then I was miserable yeah. and then the whole thing would start the next day with well the only thing I knew to do was try not to eat yeah. so then I'd make it till noon yeah. and then I'd have a candy bar and then I'd have ho-hos and then I'd have ding-dongs or whatever yeah. maybe ho-hos and ding-dongs are kind of the same thing <laughs> um, but it got um, very toxic freshman year of college okay. as many girls yeah. uh, experience you go away you're not in your comfort zone your kitchen um, the cafeterias for university students are disasters mm -hmm. because you can go to that ice cream machine and you can get as many bowls of soft ice cream as you wish in the uh, cafeteria um, there are just so many things to eat and that was when I really started feeling so weird, so different, so isolated, mm -hmm. because I thought, you know, I, who in the world would, would even understand this? I can't tell anybody I'm weird. Mm -hmm. Other people don't think like this. Sure. Look at Look at all these people at this table. They're just eating normal food. Yeah. They're just eating a piece of pizza and having a Coke. Yeah. Why can't I do that? Because right. when I started eating, I couldn't stop because yeah. I had sort of trained myself. Yeah. Food became a trigger to binge yeah. instead of what it's supposed to do. Yeah. And food is hard because you can have a goal of, to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. You can have a goal not to drink. Yeah. You cannot have a goal not to eat. Right. You have to eat. Yeah. So you have to figure it out in your life how to eat moderately. Yeah. And I really believe everything in moderation is yeah. how I 
Yeah. Think now. Well, it's I, I very much can identify with everything that you talked about. My body image distortion. Um, started with with family members and looking at fam me observing family members and how I wanted to look and, and and those types of things and then it was amplified through the sports that I was involved with yes. primarily wrestling and bodybuilding but um, but it became that cycle that um, that you referred to is because I would restrict for the sport and I liked how I looked but I didn't like how I felt then I would when given permission, then that activity oh, was over or yeah, met weight or whatever. Yeah, that just said that. And I would just yo-yo. And, um, and then when I wasn't competing, um, I didn't have a balance. I didn't I didn't have a balance. And so I know for me it took a long time um, of replacing foods, of, of foods that I wouldn't necessarily binge on um, or didn't trigger me to binge. And exactly. so I had to replace those foods. Or, or even if it wasn't the binging, it wouldn't trigger the guilt and the shame and the secret cycle that I would have in my head. Exactly, um, exactly. You, you have. I got to the point where I couldn't. Everything was a trigger, um, and I struggled with that for years. It took me years okay. until I was pregnant. Um, I was almost thirty, and when my first child was born, and it took me all those years to be able to eat somewhat normally. I still struggled, mm -hmm. but I had my safety net taken away from me. I couldn't starve myself sure. yeah. because of the baby. Yeah. And then I was on bed rest due to premature labor, and my husband was going to work, and I couldn't, I couldn't do a thing mm -hmm. except to go to the restroom. And... Um, so I stayed at my parents. Mm -hmm. My mom literally gave me my breakfast, mm -hmm. my lunch, and my dinner. Okay. It was amazing how God proved to me that, oh, I could eat a bowl of cereal without binging. Sure. Because I literally was restricted from getting up and walking into the kitchen. Yeah. And I couldn't rummage around cupboards for right. several months. Yeah. Well, gosh, I yeah. mean, you can't binge if you can't rummage around cupboards and drink Hershey syrup from the yeah. refrigerator. <laughs> well, and, and what's amazing about that is that uh, when you were just telling your story, that you had that, you were in that paradox, you were in that double bind between knowing what the doctor told you about the health of your unborn child. And if you wanted yourself and her to be healthy, or him to be healthy, her. then mm -hmm. then you're going to have to follow these orders. Yep. Which then forced you to address this other thing that he didn't have any idea about. Right. And by living through that, you recognize that maybe... Maybe there was light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. So after your daughter was born, um, and you could eat maybe normal again, and then of course you have the baby weight. Um, how did you? Um, how did you recover from that? Psychologically, how did yeah, you? Yes, psychologically. Um, well, I did better. Motherhood really agreed with me. Okay. Taking care of a child really agreed with me. Um, I realized that I had been quite anxious in a work environment, which of course doesn't mean you can just stop working. Mm -hmm. But for me, um, that that was different after having children, mm -hmm. and I could um, just take care of them because my husband and I were very blessed mm -hmm. with me being able to stay home too, as my mother had done. I know in this day and age, it's. Very dicey because a lot of people just they don't have the the blessing of yeah. being able to do that. Yeah. They have to have a dual income. You, you said something earlier about being the the classic firstborn mm -hmm. and um, of being conscientious and, and and being a hard worker. And do you think that? And then you just alluded to some of the anxiety that came with performance at work. Mm -hmm. um, and do you think that maybe there's a there's a line that's connecting that along with the Appearance and the body image and sure. What do you think about that? Well, I was raised with very um, 
parents who were very, very high achievers. They had college educations and beyond. Mm -hmm. And um, oddly enough, even my grandparents, and I'm 66, so my grandparents, I had a grandfather who was a civil engineer, oh, wow. um, a grandmother who taught English, um, her sister who was an architect, um, another sister with a college education, a brother of theirs, a doctor. I mean, this was early on, and they were an unusual family in southern Illinois that um, just believed in doing whatever you could to become more educated. Sure. Uh, my mom's family was the same, so I had uh, both, both sides, and education and homework and grades were very valued. Well, you know, you, parents walk a thin line in praising their kids for good grades mm -hmm. because it can become, oh, this is really how I get noticed. Mm -hmm. And my dad was more of a, a distant person. That was the way mm -hmm. that we got noticed okay. um, to make straight A's. And then, unfortunately, you become your own worst enemy. It's kind of like a, well, I have a friend who's a, a, a salesperson for a drug company. Well, once you get your numbers up, well, now you got to beat your numbers. Right, yeah. Well, that turns into a terrible vicious circle for somebody with good grades because nobody has to make straight A's mm -hmm. to be doing well in school, right. but once you do, then a B looks awful, sure. uh, or a B plus, and you don't get, uh, and then if you have a family that's prizing yeah. those um, those report cards with straight A's, it really becomes a vicious cycle. There's definitely, definitely a clear tie in my mind, and then... Um, Nobody in my family was heavier. Mm. They were all um, what I consider normal weight, not okay. skinny, but that extends to my uh, both sets of grandparents. And uh, I had one aunt and uncle on one side, no aunts and uncles on the other side. My cousins, it extends to, to everyone. We were, you just... You know, we're a normal size, and that's just how you fit in. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and some of the things that you're just referring to is, as a counselor, some of the things that we will look at when someone comes in to see us regarding depression or anxiety or disordered eating or whatever it may be, is that we look at not only what is what is going on behaviorally with them at that time, but that we're also going to look at genetically what what part genetically. played into it mm -hmm. and then also family dynamics what did what did uh, Lynn as a young person learn from being in that family you know in your particular case the birth order how that played a part yep. with how you're already wired the expectations generationally how how uh, about performance mm -hmm. all those things play a part as well as your own translation of where does Lynn fit into the world um, what can Lynn do what does Lynn not do and then also what are you just gifted with right yes um, and so it's all those things it mixed plays up all together. together the genetics are there of course yeah. from from the time of conception but then they play out differently compared to yeah. from how you're raised and how the environment and the school and um, we had what was called tracking mm -hmm. when I was at Bloom School sure. they recommended the track that we'd be in uh, for Lincoln mm -hmm. and now they just say uh, academic classes I believe right, and yeah. honors classes <clears throat> um, but this was a huge deal to my particular circle of friends mm -hmm. I just got in with this really smart group sure and we call <laughs> at Guilford we called ourselves the smart kids yeah. not because we were giving ourselves a compliment but because we weren't the jocks we weren't the 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 really gorgeous uh, homecoming queens and cheerleaders and we were we were the kids that 
took all the hardest classes and did well in and school. did well and challenged each other and hung out together right yeah. And I think, you know, and like you said earlier, they can become a reinforcing loop. It can become a vicious cycle, mm -hmm. just like the whole thing with the food and the restriction. And there's some positive things that can come from that, of, of being in that social group, of, of academically challenging each other. Mm -hmm. And it can have its shadow side or that dark side as well. And I think it is that balance, similar to what you said earlier, is that you don't get over um, an eating disorder or a food disorder by re by removing it, like we do with alcohol or heroin. Exactly, you, you can't. You have to change your relationship with that food, your perception of how you see yourself in the mirror and how you look at food. You has to, that relationship has to evolve and, yes. and change. Yes. So, I know, as you mentioned earlier, that as your life continued growing, as your kids got older, um, you had um, some family tragedies that happened. Yes. And uh, tell, tell us a little bit about wh how you um, what happened but then also more, as important how did you how did you handle that how did you cope with that how did you change as a person and evolve with those things well um, so when I was 35 I had two kids I had my oldest Sarah and then my our son Mark and I was pregnant with the third one Kara and um, my brother, my younger brother, Scott, at that time, um, he would have been 26, he had experienced debilitating depression and life-changing depression, um, maybe a few signs of it in high school, but in college it really began uh, with full force. Um, and that was true of my sister as well but he became it became more obvious sooner with him okay so he did finish college we all went to U of I we all graduated from there and he was an electrical engineer um, he followed my older brother, my next brother to me, followed in my dad's footsteps and became an electrical engineer like my dad, who also had a law degree. So you can see, mm -hmm, sure, <laughs> very <yes>. high achievers. <laughs> yes. um, and my brother Bruce was took to it very naturally because he had grown up following my dad around and helping him with projects and as he says <laughs> he came out of the womb with somebody saying hold this flashlight up here <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and he did well with it he moved to California uh, and began his career which he's um, which has evolved into other things, but all related to the initial part. Okay. Um, now he has his own business installing um, all the um, electrical and interface for uh, offices. Oh, okay. In the walls. Okay. okay. <laughs> and that's Bruce. That's Bruce. Okay. And then um, Scott, I think, wanted to be like Bruce. Mm. Uh, Bruce and my dad always got along so well because Bruce was so mellow mm -hmm. and when my dad would say something that was just you know critical or kooky or something Bruce could kind of turn it around he, he just had this way about him he still does he's he's just an amazing person so Scott the youngest one um, also Mm -hmm. went through U of I as an electrical engineer. Okay. But it was difficult for him. And he would, you know, we didn't have cell phones. Mm -hmm. So I, and because I'm nine years older, my perspective is so, uh, so different. For instance, if he was 18, I was um, 27, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So, you know, I was far beyond I was out of college. I was working. I had my own place, yeah. and I could observe all this. and And I remember my mom saying, oh, 
I have to get a hold of your sister because I can't get a hold of your brother because I don't know if he has the money that he needs for the rest of the semester. And there was none of this online stuff and none of these cell phones. Sure. So she'd have to trek over to his dorm because there were only two years between them. And she'd always, you know, okay, okay. So she'd trek over there and, Scott, call mom. Mm-hmm. She can't get a hold of you. She wants to know if you need money. You better call her. Um, but I, I remember a lot of things that, um, from from the perspective of a 27, 28, sure. 29, 30-year-old. Yeah. Um and so where was I with that? And, and you you were talking about how he, he wanted to be a lot like Bruce. He did. So he graduated in electrical engineering. He made it through. He made it through on time and uh, moved to California like Bruce. Okay. And got a motorcycle like Bruce mm. and got a dog like Bruce. Okay. And the whole thing um, was not as a natural a fit okay. for him. Um, as for Bruce, and he began to get to show signs of severe clinical depression. He had shown this in college, but somehow he muddled through. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't have to be in class nine to five. Yeah. You don't have to support yourself. Right. At least in my family, you didn't. Um, and he began to struggle. Ended up needing having to come back to Rockford and live in my parents' lower level. And he was ashamed of that. Mm, Um, He had to more or less give up his life and the life that he thought he could have. His depression began to get worse. He had worked for Janet Waddles. He lost the job because he just didn't show up. Uh, His depressions hit in the fall. And... This happened for six consecutive years. It was really like, um, not like flipping a switch because that would have been, you know, one day he's absolutely fine and the next day he isn't. But it was like um, pulling a shade down on his life, uh, on the life as he knew it. Mm -hmm. And he didn't feel he could function, didn't feel he could go to work, didn't feel he could get out of bed after a while, and it just became a chronic, Mm -hmm. severe, it was a severe recurrent depression that became chronic and did not let up. Mm -hmm. Um, And so where was I with that? Well, he's now back at home. He's had he's ten, living with my parents, yeah. which are in Rock, who are yeah. in Rockford, and I was in Rockford okay. because I was offered a job when I got out of school. Yeah. And he's um, attempting to work, but he's not be able to do that. He did for a while, and then he couldn't. Um, and and had he sought out help at this point? I mean, obviously he did have at a counselor. Waddles. Well, he worked at Janet Waddles, but he lost that job. Yeah. Um, he, my parents said, well. You need a counselor. You need a psychiatrist. He um, he did go and get. Um, he did start seeing a psychiatrist. He did get on medication, okay. um, but he had talked with a psychiatrist about how you know when this happens, um, I it's so bad, yeah. and. Um, we knew it was bad because he wasn't working. Yeah. But we didn't have any experience with depression to that degree. We didn't have any experience with suicide. We didn't I mean, who would think that he would take his life, that mm-hmm. he would get to that point? We didn't put sure. that together. Yeah. And so, um, he was living at my mom and dad's house. They were gone for the weekend. And it wouldn't have mattered if they were or not. He would have found a different way. Um, And when they came home, uh, it was dark outside, and there was not one light on. Mm -hmm. And 
They called out his name, went downstairs. The dog, his dog was in a crate and going absolutely nuts because it hadn't been let out all day. Sure. So they let the dog out and then they they found out what happened. And um, it was the most jarring, shocking, um, just getting your face slapped, your head slammed, just this feeling of what, 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 what? Yeah. What do you, what, what, what happened? Um, and so do you want me to say more about? How, how old was he when he died? 26. 26, so that would I was 35. 35, okay. And... And so, obviously, I mean, not a, family members had been aware that he was depressed and that he'd been struggling. Yes. But like many times, we talk about it's only afterwards do we see how clear the signs. Oh golly! Are. Well, we didn't really have signs necessarily that he put out there. I'm going to take my life. Right. Exactly. Um, but behavioral patterns. But can, behavioral patterns. He you, you can kept look at losing all, a job yeah. and and felt embarrassed. Yeah. I was trying to see him during those months, and he, I couldn't get him to agree to see me because he was ashamed. So, yeah. um, and I was pregnant, and um, I had a high risk pregnancy. So I was having contractions halfway through my pregnancy, and I was on partial bed rest. Sure. Um, but on Saturday, the, before he died, I I did the the one thing for the day that I that I was going to do, and that was make cookies with my two older kids. And then um, that evening, I said to him, I. Um, we're going to come over, we're going to pop over, um, and, um, and bring you some cookies. So we, we did, and my children were four and two, um, and especially the boy, Mark, very active, <laughs> and, um, loved, loved his Uncle Scott, and we went over there and visited with him, but he was clearly not himself. Mm -hmm. Now, I've struggled with that for a long time because that was the last time I saw him, but that was the last time anybody in our family saw him. Okay. Okay. Um, and it was the same for my sister and the same for my dad. I was the last okay. one, always the last one, um, to see these these people before, before they passed away. Well, well, yeah, tell us a little bit, then how did mom, Bruce, your sister, your dad, how did they d deal with Scott's, uh, Scott's death? Well, we were, we felt blindsided. Sure, yeah. And just stymied and stuck and unable to process for a while, and, um... God protected my unborn child, who already wanted to come out, because that was the necessary thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I was lying down most of the day. My kids were playing in front of the couch. Um, I, I made it through, and I was not falling apart. Mm. I had two children and a pregnancy. I I just was not falling apart. Mm -hmm. I I just had a job. Couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't. Which goes back to that kind of that situation you were in in your first pregnancy, where you knew that you had to listen to what the doctor was telling exactly. you for the pregnancy. So similar in your third pregnancy. Similar. I had to take care of this child, and I told my obstetrician you know, what had happened, and he said, well, I 
I have had a, a pregnant woman lose lose her husband mm -hmm. to cancer. It makes it very difficult to get through those last few months. Sure. But I had a routine. I could go down the stairs one time per day. I could go up the stairs one time okay. per day. So I went down the stairs, uh, lay on the couch. Um, people had to pretty much wait on me, um, which did give my mom something to do. She did. Sure. I mean, she came over with macaroni and cheese, and she she loved the kids, of course. Sure. So it did give her something to do. Okay. Um, and, and I... And I got through that period I think very um, protected sure and my my um, baby was even though I was on bed rest and they were saying don't do this don't do that we, we did get to the end gotcha okay good okay you just alluded to that your sister also struggled with depression she did and uh, tell us a little bit about that because that's another part of the story that oh, it's a huge part of the story and um, I have talked to a few people, not too many, that have had another suicide mm -hmm. after the first. And we've agreed your mindset somehow is it's unthinkable that it would ever happen again. You, d you don't allow, it's denial. Sure. It couldn't happen again. Yeah, this, this isn't supposed to happen. It couldn't. Yeah. It's already happened. Right. That was the worst thing right. that could ever happen. Yeah. It happened to us. We're putting one foot in front of the other. That was the worst thing, but it, it wasn't. Um, Anne showed more signs of depression in high school than Scott did. Um, it's rather sad, and my mom commented on this m later, to look at her school picture. Um, she had such a um, sort of a wistful, um, very uh, vulnerable look on her face. She didn't look happy. She wasn't smiling. Um, and again, I was seven years older than Anne, so mm. if I was 24 and she was 17, right. I wasn't in the home anymore. Yeah. Um, I was going by what my mom said or... Um, when I was in college, in fact, Anne and I corresponded longhand, mm. and I still have. I brought the folder that I have, a, like one of those um, things with um, oh, the pocket places, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then you put the stretchy band around yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, I still have letters that, that she sent to me, and then somehow she, I guess she had saved letters that I sent to her oh, so then my, that my mom gave me so uh, I went through them all and I kept the ones that were the most fun and the most um, just crazy we just she Anne had a tendency to <laughs> write as you would speak. If she wanted to emphasize something, the letters were this big <laughs> and she used orange paper mm -hmm. and she used crazy pens and she used mm -hmm. six exclamation points True. and you know, I can't wait till you come home mm -hmm. and I got an orange blouse, <laughs> O-I-N-G-E and she just had this thing about orange and orange paper and but she spelled out the crazy Sure. ways that she pronounced things and we got a lot of laughs out of them and we did letter writing because you That's didn't have did. anything else sure. um, so so where was I with that where, and so you were talking about Anne's showed more signs of depression when she was in high school and then uh, obviously that probably continued in, into college it did but she managed sure. and she went to U of I too and she was with Scott at that point and she graduated okay. as um, a teacher with an emphasis in art, but she had uh, so much anxiety. She did her student teaching and she graduated, but she never was able to uh, teach. She um, she. 
she worked in retail for a while and she had a roommate um, and she was to herself a lot of the times and we would write back and forth and we shared about our depression and anxiety and we shared about our faith and how it could help us through and we had to give it to God and get help um, and looking back at one point she was very much my support mm -hmm. because I remember this so clearly well you know, you can't really say you remember that anything real clearly, yeah. right? Because it <laughs> might not be true. They're proving. Yeah, you, you remember the story you remember. <laughs> I remember the story I remember, and it was that I was working as an occupational therapist, and I was anxious. I just can't believe I lived like this for so long. I just counted the the hours until I could get out of there. I don't know what made me so anxious. It wasn't a difficult job, mm -hmm. but I just, my anxiety was sky high all the time. I'd go in the bathroom stall and lock the door and lean my head against the metal and it was always cool, so that was a relief and I'd just practically be hyperventilating. Um, it was just mind-boggling um, and I didn't know what it was it wasn't I didn't have a word for it I didn't have an identification for it I wasn't seeing a counselor but I remember one time telling her I just sit there and I'm with a patient and I just I just I'm just looking at the clock and I'm just thinking well I only have two hours and, and then I can leave and I just I just don't know what to do I just don't know what to do and I remember her saying to me well Thank God that you have eyes to see the clock. Mm. She was very much my support. Okay, okay. So we traded back and forth. Okay. She'd be, I'd be worse, she'd be better, she'd be worse, I'd be better. And that went on for quite a while. Um, she didn't die till she was 43. Okay. So she did find somebody that really understood her, and she did have a lot of quirks, but she found the right guy, Rick, and he was a gem, and he loved her for who she was, and they married. They were about 30 at the, at the time they got married, I think. Uh, they stayed in Champaign-Urbana, where they had both gone to school. Okay. And um, and I was living here in Rockford because, like I said, I got a job offer, and that segued into a different job. And you know, I was working at Rockford Memorial. Um, so she was forty-two when she died. Three, yeah, forty-three. Mm -hmm. She was older. She had been through a lot of years of ups and downs. Okay. And she she and I had extremely different thought processes. If somebody told me why don't you try this or why don't you um, you could do this I would I would do it I would try it mm -hmm. she thought she knew what would work for her and what wouldn't mm -hmm. and she got the idea in her head that medication was not going to help her and mm -hmm. if somebody did talk her into being on medication she would always find a reason to get off the medication okay. Gotcha. So once again, this this perception of of similar to um, in Scott's case, there was a, a belief about where he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be like his brother, Bruce, right? That maybe contributed and played a part yes. into his psychology and and very much um, with with your sister that you know she may have gotten to a reinforcing loop of avoidance and that learned how to reduce that initial anxiety by avoidance. Okay. But but may but unfortunately with avoidance, similar to what we talked about earlier with food, is that it it does doesn't really solve it, it may solve the initial aspect of the anxiety, but there's not a solution to anxiety. That's by not avoidance. a long right because she didn't work um, in the field that she had chosen, which is okay. That's okay. You can find other things, yeah. but she didn't work full time, mm -hmm. and she didn't work in a in. Um, something challenging right um, and that sense of purpose 
which were which right. clearly is a family dynamic and a family, right. you know, legacy. You know, has been an element and it, an achieve, high achieving family yeah. with myself and my brother Bruce. Right. Um, and I, I found out later, her counselor was willing to talk to me after she died okay. because he said he knew that my brother had died and Ann had died and. My brother Scott dying by suicide was a big um, struggle for Anne, of course. So the counselor knew that. Yeah. And after Anne died... And she died via suicide as well. She did. Yeah. Uh-huh. Different method. Okay. Yeah, I have three, three of the six of us, three different methods, which is... Yeah, you just can't even... Imagine it. Um, but she, um, so where was I with that? Well, you going along with that, and you, you're talking about the third individual who died from suicide, and that's why I was going to ask, from your perspective, how did, now your parents are getting older, mm -hmm. right? So you're 50 at the time when Ann dies, so when 49, Anne died. 50 years yeah, old. I was 50. And um, and so then that, that would put your, your parents, you know, 70-ish. Um, yeah, they would have been... Um, Cl yeah, they would have been late seventies. Late seventies. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so now they've lost, and which is in itself horrific, right? That, that you outlive horrific. your children, anyways. But yeah. then, then you're seeing that that they've two of your two of your four children have died as a result of suicide, and you're in, they're in their seventies, late seventies, and careers are they're retired. I'm assuming now. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Tell us a little bit how they dealt with that, and then I know that your mom then, um, during that time period, uh, became sick. Got sick in her early eighties. Okay. Yeah. They both were in their early eighties. I think. Um, uh, I think she was eighty two, and he was eighty three when she got sick. Okay. Um, well, watching my mom struggle was always one of the hardest things of my life. And um, I know that people would, people came up to me after Scott died, and then again after Ann died, how are your parents doing? How are your mom, how's your mom doing? Well, that was very hard for me to know her suffering. But I also had my own struggles. Mm -hmm. I remember one person <laughs> I wanted to say, how come nobody ever asks how I'm doing? Sure. You know. Um, but um, they, what can you do? They did the best they could. They, um, things were kind of rolling along after, because Scott died 32 years ago now, but my parents died in 2012, so um, that was um, nine years ago. So by the time they were retired, let's see, that was about the time Scott died. About the time they retired. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. and my dad wanted to get a motor home, mm -hmm. and he wanted to travel, mm -hmm. and my mom didn't like it at first, but then she ended up okay. really liking it. Okay. Um, they even went away the first, did they go away the first winter? No, because both my siblings died in the late, late fall around the holidays. Um, they didn't go away the first winter, but starting the the next winter um, after Scott died, um, they they started going away okay. for like four months. Gotcha, okay. Mm -hmm. So your mom uh, had cancer? Is that how? My mom had cancer in her 40s, but that was um, surgically taken care of and she remained cancer free. She, um, around 80, started to um, get a little out of breath. Oh, okay. She was diagnosed with um, pulmonary disease, and that became COPD, and then um, 
she also had some heart issues and then she had kidney issues she said all I'm doing now is going to doctors it's I'm sure. just tired of it yeah. but it was I think the interplay yeah. of those things that took her down um, she just it was too many systems that were too compromised sure yeah and she how old was she when she died she was 82 i believe 82 and your mom and dad are the same age yes yeah. and then your dad is 82 then well yeah they're one one year okay 82. you know one so, so he was year apart he was 83, 83 i believe um he was born in 27 and he died in 2012 Okay. They both died in 2012. Okay. She was born in 28. He was born in 27. They both died in 2012. I, I keep getting mixed up as to actually his age at the time, but it was somewhere close. Yeah, close enough. Close yeah, enough. Close sure. enough. So, in, and I think you shared this with when we were talking before, is that in response to her death and him being 83 um, at this time and a combination of different things and he also then died from suicide he did and it was only 10 weeks later yeah. and I'm telling you once again after my sister had died well this is the worst thing right but I I was beyond <laughs> beyond trying to work it out and figure it out. I just I, I just could not imagine that knowing how horrendous it was to lose a brother and sister that he actually chose that. I know he wasn't thinking of me. Sure. I know he wasn't thinking of Bruce. But um I didn't have any anger with Scott and Anne. I have a little bit of anger with my dad because I think to myself, how could you have done that? Mm -hmm. After all our family has been through, mm -hmm. how could you have done that? But his suicide, it's hard to explain unless you've unless you know pretty much about suicide, but um, most of the time suicide can be traced back to severe depression, mm -hmm. possibly drug abuse, mm -hmm. possibly a combination of other mental health illnesses sure. at the same time. Yeah. Um, my dad's was more because he and my mom had been married. Um, they married in... Um, 49 so they have been married for 60 years I think or even maybe a little longer and he just basically and he's not a man of faith mm -hmm. and he just basically shook his fist at God and said you're not calling the shots mm -hmm. okay. big house they had never downsized big house mm -hmm. a lot of land um a lot of responsibility of a lot of stuff yeah. and I think he just rattled around in that house and couldn't sleep well and just thought I'm I'm not gonna do this it was quite different because you didn't see that spiraling that mm -hmm. illness sort of taking over yeah. their thought processes and making them more not so much with Scott but with Anne she became I learned that you can have some psychotic thinking mm -hmm. without being diagnosed with psychosis Correct. she never had the diagnosis of schizophrenia she didn't um but there can be psychotic have a features clear with break with reality but she started 
with some really stinking thinking. Yeah. She she wouldn't go to restaurants because she didn't know how the food was cooked, yeah. and she didn't um, trust um, her husband or any of us to you know wash our hands well enough, and then we'd have to do it again. And um, she didn't want to touch any um, anything having to do with the washer for some reason. She she got so caught up in her OCD, her obsessive compulsive disorder, and her, um, it, that it became paranoia to sure. a certain extent. And it, and it can evolve to that. As and that's what happened, because so, she was so ill. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the things that, having done some work through SOS regarding different um, different types of individuals who struggle and um, the prevalency of someone who, or in your case, a family of overachievers, the prevalency of suicide and depression. And in some of it, and maybe this maybe speaks more to your father, um, but again, I think it may very much be there for, for Scott and Anne as well, is this idea of a lot of times overachievers will just continue achieving. And and so their way of coping with a loss or a setback is not necessarily experiencing that um, from an emotional level, that loss, right. but will just achieve something else. And then in, in maybe in your dad's case, when when mom died, now what? Now what? what? Now what? And, and he probably was very much purpose-driven um, throughout his whole life. He was a self-made man. Man. He, they grew up in the Depression. Mm -hmm. His parents had very little. He scrabbled and worked and fought and did everything, yeah. everything yeah. himself. And so mom dies, and he has everything. He has everything, but now he can't. You need two people to drive. You could drive a motor home alone, but it would be very tricky just to back into your camping space. Sure. Well, and it also probably in his case wasn't the point. Um, well, but, he wanted to, he said, I'll never be able, one of the first things he said was, I'll never be able to drive the motor home again. Mm -hmm. So he came over to, and parked it in our street and just... He said, let's take everything off out of it. Yeah. So, so let me want to hear with, with some of the time we have remaining. I want to hear about in the midst of all the different things and, you know, with your own journey of, of starting off, uh, you know, as a young person and long before it was really ever spoken about uh, um, disordered eating and eating disorders and body image, um, though I do think it was happening, but it was very Oh, much, it was happening. There's no doubt about it. But we didn't it, talk about it. We didn't talk about it and it didn't, wasn't named. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then your own anxiety and performance anxiety that may have came. There may have been a chemical imbalance that came, and, and some genetic. Uh, well, this is genetic. That there, the, the, yes, I have talked to medical personnel and my psychiatrists who say this. This yeah. is genetic. Yeah. And some of it was, on one hand, some of the stuff that mom and, and dad and the family provided for you was that structure of being able to work hard and the confidence and the smart kids that you were involved with. And so there was a level of confidence and competency that came um, during that. But then there's always, sounds like there was this undercurrent of, of the anxiety, even when you were first working as an OT. Oh, there was definitely and it was in, you know, in even in grade school, um, when I, I remember being in sixth grade, and all I did when I came home was homework. Yeah. And my, my siblings were playing. Yeah. And I just didn't get it. Yeah. I just thought, well... <laughs> Okay, well, I'm just that old that I, that's all I get to do is homework. Yeah. But it was also that reinforcing loop. You knew what it was like to get a good grade. Yeah. And you didn't want it to not get it. So it was like, yeah. kind of like the food thing or the binging or the, or the uh, restriction, right? But if you haven't gone through different, obviously different losses and some of your different struggles and, and now having done different modalities of treatment, um, you know, I, I think about a couple of different things as I was listening to you tell your story today. I, I think of that during some of the more difficult times of your life, the darker times with your siblings and with difficult pregnancies, 
um, that there was an element where you had opportunities to be uh, uh, taken care of, right, as well as opportunities for growth yes. of, of your own personal growth um, that happened. And so, That's right. So tell us a little bit about where you see now some of the growth that you've had based upon facing some of the, the challenges that have been in your life. Okay, well, um, we're not going to have enough time for me to talk about my own depression, but when that started... It was so difficult, and it continued up until recently. So that was 11 years. And I so really the got to... moved it into depression. Depression, and I yeah. really got to find out what's gotten Anne experienced, okay. and it was to that point. Okay. Um, but I want to say, in case we stop taping here, that... Um, I have a good life. I'm very blessed. I am thankful for all that I have. There's that prayer, you know, God, um, help, uh, help me with what I've lost, but what help me with what you've left me, you yeah, know, whatever yeah, that is. Yeah. And um, he's left me a lot. Yeah. He's left me with an appreciation of my own life mm -hmm. one day at a time because mm -hmm. I have little adages I live by sure. and one of them is one day at a time if I'm struggling to do something it's pull 10 weeds mm -hmm. it's too much to think of anything else yeah. but 10 yeah. so when I walk the dog oh, I ain't up on 10 weeds mm -hmm. um, that's just how I how I get through things. And I have a wonderful husband who has been there for me. Um, he didn't know about any of this. We didn't know about any of this when we married in 1980. Uh, my kids are wonderful. In my dark times, they have each called me every day or twice a day. Just checking in, Mom, you know, just kind of. And then the one that's in Rockford, just stopping in, you know, sure. lying down on the bed with me, yeah. just being there. And um, they have learned a lot, I think, yeah. um, because they're old enough to uh, the they're definitely old enough to remember my sister mm -hmm. um, and remember her when in good times yeah and um, uh, a little too young to remember uh, my brother but we do have pictures of the older two with with him um, and I just have this perspective on life that I want to be the person that um, especially Anne would want me to be. Mm -hmm. I want to do things that she was unable to do. Mm -hmm. I want to grow in ways that she was unable because her life was so shortened. Mm -hmm. um, I know she wants the best for me. Mm -hmm. And I just know that a lot of times I, I think I'm going to live well mm -hmm. because of what's happened to me. Sure. Well, I think of, as you were telling your story, I think of the, the different scenarios where, um, where you, uh, e even with the beginning of, I want to look differently than I think I look. Mm-hmm. And, and wanting to achieve. And as you clearly um, talked about, that we can get out of balance with that. Yes. Um, but very similar to that, when you were pregnant with your first, and you, it was a high-risk pregnancy, and you were told that for the health of your baby, you can't leave the bed. You're, very, you're restricted. The last part. It was the last six weeks or whatever it was yeah and so you, I was okay till then yeah, so you were restricted but that gave you the opportunity to look at food differently and it did and and for the first time maybe in a long time for oh in since 
I was before adolescence. Yeah. And then the, also that element of not only being able to to go through that, and that's what we refer to this resiliency. Yes. But then you also have a, a greater purpose because of how your relationship is with your sister. Yes. Greater purpose because of your relationship with God, your higher power. Yes. Um, I think those elements give you some tools to, to combat um, depression. Yes. And then there's something else that, you know, we didn't get a lot into it, but we can maybe get into it another time when you come on, is all the different types of things that you've attempted to do to get it on the other side of this depression. Well, that is a long story in itself. Yeah. Yeah, that is a long story because it was so, such a long period mm -hmm. of ups and downs and ins and outs and finding a psychiatrist and counselor and starting to take medication. I had not taken medication yeah. for depression. So that is a very long story. And then um, it just became worse. I think after my parents died, sure. um, I was able to function pretty normally till, till when they passed away. Then I, I started getting on a little more tenuous ground. So that's a long story in itself. But in spite of even that, um, life is good. Yeah. I laugh all the time. Yeah. Um, my husband and my friends and my kids and I, we, we find, you know, so many things that are funny in life. And um, I'm very forgetful because of some of my treatment. But honestly, we laugh till we're sick. <laughs> I just, you know, one time I went to church uh, with one hand with nail polish and one hand without. Sure. I've gone places with one earring. I've gone places with... Just, I I just lose my train of thought, yeah. as you've seen a few sure. evidence of it. Sure. But you know, what are you going to do? You got to yeah. you got to laugh about it. So, so one of the beautiful things of being as someone who uh, can identify with overachieving and uh, and and identify with body image, I think one of the beautiful things about what you just gave as an example, of, similar to how we started, was that when you were a teenager, you were very concerned of what people would think and how they would judge you based upon right. your appearance. Right. Right. And now you can laugh if you forget to the other set of oh, earrings. Oh, I have pulled some doozies. Some doozies. <laughs> Uzies. So, um, so yes, I've had, I mean, plus I'm married to somebody that can, he just knows how to kid me out of sure, it. Sure, You know. Which is, uh, I think, again, is a good partner, uh, ability to, to laugh and, and in a, in a high achieving family, um, and, and having performance anxiety to learn that we can laugh at some of our things instead of taking it so serious. Oh, yes. I think those are some huge, uh, huge life lessons. Lessons that being able Huge to share life those lessons, with. and I have others too. Things pop in my head, and I can do. I can like riff off of, sure. you know, one day at a time, or yeah. or uh, don't borrow trouble, or you know, I can just do this whole riff on. Um, I don't know if that's what you call it, yeah. but I think that's sure. what you call yeah. it, where you just keep going, sure. yeah. uh, because. Life just gives you so many lessons to help with future things that right. happen if right. you pay attention. Very much so. If you pay attention. And I do think it is very much that. It's an evolving process. And just as we've been talking on the journey with different individuals who've come on here, is that it's it's similar to what you said as an OT, is that we can't control what has already happened. We can definitely work on adapting and evolving and how am I going to live life now. No. You know, Lynn, I appreciate so much you being here Thank and, you, and Kevin. sharing your story. Um, it's uh, it's a it's not only is an amazing and, and incredible all the different things that your family has has faced, um, but it's one of those things that no matter how much things look on the outside, on the inside, um, uh, it can it can tear a family apart and tear individuals apart. Exactly. And then the lessons we can learn from that, though, is how can we have how can we learn from them so they don't just are, aren't just losses, but they're actually learning opportunities too. Right, and I I always think if I speak or if I do any writing or anything, if I can encourage one person yeah. that there is life with depression yeah. and that 
they can do it too and that you know it's not easy but you do it one step at a time you get people behind you you get determined mm -hmm. and you say if if at all possible i'm not going to let my brain chemicals get that low yeah i don't want this to happen yeah. to my family again yeah and you you said something that that depression will lie to you, and so you have to have all those protective factors, all those other oh, you things have on to. your side, because the depression will lie. The to depression you. will lie, and they, it will tell you that. One time, it told me that you know it really wouldn't matter if I was gone. Yeah. There was only one person that it would matter to, yeah. and it was one of my kids. And yeah. of course, that's not true. Yes. Yeah. But. But it lies. It was hard not to buy into it. Yeah, very, very much so. And that's where we have to have other people around us, have other professionals. Yes. And you keep searching until you find the right one for you. Yes. Lynn, thank you very much thank for being so here. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. And we will definitely have you on if you're open to that. To oh, I'd really like story. to. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. We're going to march forward. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining uh, this episode and look forward to uh, being with you again next week.